<laughs> and especially if you see a baby, baby, tiny little plant just starting to grow and turns into that bait sucker. I mean, it's amazing. Same is true with butterflies and moths. They start from that little egg and they turn into a beautiful atlas moth. I mean, it takes weeks and months, but these things happen. Well, the same is true with uh, the critters. I mean, I'm working with critters that are here today for the field guides, and these are my freelance projects. But I'm also working with critters that are, in this case, this is Phenexia strigoi, and it's an early tetrapod 300 million years ago, when Pennsylvania was below the equator in plate tectonics movements. So the United States moved up from below the equator. So today we're going to learn about some of these things and how I get to play with these things. So let's see if I can get this target to work, okay? Um, this is what my desk was over at the Carnegie Museum. This is a standard art desk, and I think they got it from a printing shop. And uh, a couple pieces that I, I did work on in the back, uh, in the background. We've got two covers of science, very fortunate. These things happen. And you can see some of those images and how they were produced in these folio books afterward. Some artists I've been inspired by are uh, James Ernest, who is more of a contemporary. He's still around. He, he lives in Virginia. And he worked at Smithsonian. And he studied at Carnegie Mellon, as, as did I get to study at Carnegie Mellon. And he worked a little bit at the Carnegie Museum. So there's some similarities. And I've heard a number of uh, well, little tidbits about them. And he, he now does work all over the world, where he flies to different museums around the world. He does a number of geographic works. But he, he reconstructs the critters. That point is really not important. So from the skeleton, puts, figures out the muscles, and then flushes it out. And Charles Knight was one of the early gentlemen to do this in paleontology, where he worked from the fossil record. And if you're familiar with any fossils just going through the museum, they're not complete, they're incomplete. You have minimal pieces of information. And he's, he's considered the father of uh, paleo art in the sense that he took it and he reconstructed these critters and made them look like they're alive today. And he did, num he was, he did a number of pieces at the American Museum, that's pretty much where he was based. And I only recently found out in the past uh, year and a half but the gentleman was legally kind of not blind, but very nearsighted. He couldn't drive because his work, he worked really close, and then he had other painters paint the large murals from his smaller paintings and drawings. I didn't know this. I was quite surprised to learn this. We had a show at the Tony Mazian. Um, first, we're going to speak about Phenexia uh, skull. And this why is it named Phenexia? Well, it's down on Phenex land. And so, Phenexia, we spoke with them and they gave us the okay to have the fossil the Carnegie Museum. And the young student that found this, this is a road cut, just only in the past 20 years, to go to their main, one of their main facilities in Pittsburgh. And in the Councilman Formation in the Strata, that's where they, they found this, in the Birmingham shell to the left center is where the stone that matches the stone in the fossil. The fossil was actually on the bottom where the people were walking. The student passed it. He found it, picked it up, and said, oh, this looks like fern. Dropped it back down. Walked around. Came back to get on the bus two hours later or three hours later, and he saw it again. Oh, I pick it up and show it to my teacher. He shows it to his professor. The professor looks at it and says, wait a minute, that's not fern. student over there in the center, and you can see the orbits in the fossil are not prepared out, and over on the right, they are prepared out. Uh, our preparator, Henry, Henry C. Al Fowler's uh, uh, mineralogist, he, he's into, he, he works in paleo, and he understands the, the rock formations of this area. And uh, Dr. Berman knows tetrabrons. When he saw the side of that fossil, he said, wait a minute. Those lines that go down, those are teeth. And then he looked at the surface texture of the skull in the top or left, and he said, that's, that's, this might be a tetrapod. Well, there's only 
three or four known species of these things. Like, literally, species, different types. And this one was found in Western Pennsylvania. And one of the neat characteristics um, is, that, is there's little teeth that are not just in the tooth row, but they're on the palate, the top of her mouth. And that's one of the uh, key characteristics for tetrapods uh, also. Well, there's a number of them. But um, anyway, so I, I asked to be on this project when he was describing this because how often do you get a fossil in your backyard? You've been living in Pittsburgh yeah. for a number of years. So, yeah, well, why were they cool. looking around that space anyway in the first place? They were on a ge it was a geology, geology class. class. And so. they were learning about they would find they were learning about the strata, but they were also learning about the different fossils. And they were finding little gastropods and things like this, and ferns. But to find this was just So it was a known key. site that the people walked around for. Yeah, but uh, what they think actually happened is they went back to see if they could find other postcranial, which is not skull, but the rest of the body. And it probably popped out of the crust. And uh, probably 20 feet in the air or something much higher than where uh, the rest is, where people can re reach to. Uh, fossilization, I don't know the, the gist of it, but I, I understand it's quite a delicate occurrence to actually get a good fossil because all the, the conditions have to be so in such a mm -hmm. good situation scenario that it actually gets fossilized a lot of things just deteriorate break down so not everything that dies gets fossilized just because it got covered in mud mm -hmm. or dirt so in this case you can see the different views of it and the red lines you actually use marker to show where the sutures are and that center dot on the top of the Thing. It's actually a primitive characteristic of a single cell optic nerve. A single dot between the eyes, a gray dot. And so we worked and looked at uh, with these other critters uh, that were described. That one was found with Tucky and um, Coriopteryx and some of these other ones. And they had a pretty full, complete skeleton on the one. In the diagram, you can see. The, the solider lines of the skeleton. I'll say hand. Um, in this case, we had no postcranium, nothing back past the head. And actually, we only had 90% of the head. So if you look at the diagram, part of the jaw is missing. And uh, so I just put it on. So my job was to take this information after we did the technical drawings, which we saw a couple of. And uh, we did all the technical drawings and charts and graphs for the actual paper which was published in the Carnegie Annals. Um, and it had peer review. And then we followed it up with reconstructing the script. Because this is a neat opportunity. We like to do PR images. So first we work up the skeleton based on the, form, the related species. Work up the, and I'm using tracing paper overlays. Actually, I use uh, vellum. And uh, it's a little, it's called uh, Denrel. It's a little, uh, uh, more stable. And basically layer the information. Work up the skeleton, work up the shape. So here's the pen and ink of the skeleton. And, uh, the shape. That's. Then do, I put another overlay, and in this case I actually transferred it, the outline of that former information, the outline for it, and the key part, onto um, paper or watercolor paper and did the pencil directly on that. So this is actually a pencil of what, and think of a Gila monster, lots of little bumps, different sized bumps, cadence bumps, and this is the earliest critters to walk on land. And there was, there was different types of lizards that or salamanders or tetrapods. There's, this is an extinct lineage tetrapod. And they were the earliest things to come out of the water and walk on the land and eating insects, eating each other. There's no, there's no birds, there's no dinosaurs, there's no mammals, none of that stuff. This is way back. This was another uh, parallel critter uh, on the left we used for his, the Astrea and four babies. And then um, one we did was Orbeides and this guy's the other one. 
And then we looked at modern salamanders. We looked at modern critters to see how things work because the arms kind of walk like this. They don't, they don't walk like this like a mammal. They kind of have their elbows partly out, and they're low to the ground, and they just kind of look for things on the ground and just eat them up. So here's some of the process, and because I'll do the, uh, the drawings traditional, but then I use a computer to, uh, to model it together. And in this case, we, <coughs> we're making a different, the, making a mask, kind of like a wood for screen making the texture of the bumps. And the, the diagrams are the pencil drawing contrasted, scanned in and contrasted. That's black up in the top left. And then a color pencil overlay to put the colors. And then I, super, I superimpose them in the computer and put that texture on it. Make a pattern for the dots. So it looks like it's light coming through the canopy of ferns, tree ferns. Mm. And that way it's broken up. So when a predator comes at it, bigger lizard or whatever, critter, bigger tetrapod, they, all they see is dots. They don't see that it's a critter. It's just like mammals today or like Gila monsters out west. They get blended in and they can't focus on them. So they're, they're safe. Mm -hmm. So that, I figured make a pattern and then uh, inverse it. And that allowed us to get that pattern placed onto the animal. Uh, it's just a detail to show you the, the detail for the bumps to match the, the cadence of the uh, shape of the animal, the ribs, and so forth. And here's our final image. We give it a little bit of glazing on the top to make it to look like the skylight, a little bit of the sky blue to make it look like it's outdoors and the highlights. Now, I'm sorry, excuse me, Mark, would that be what blue would you use for that? <laughs> just sky blue. I mean, different. Mediums have different names for other colors. Mm -hmm. So I'm just using a real light sky blue like today. You know, just a really light five percent pastel on there. That's and, uh, so you mentioned different mediums. Mm -hmm. uh, what medium did you choose for this? This image is a composite on the computer from those former images. Because like sometimes I only have uh, two or three weeks to pull this together. I, mm. And to do a final painting of this like this, with potential edits that the scientists come up with last minute, uh, and he was wavering back and forth, five toes, four toes, five toes, four toes, on the front foot. Because we don't have the postcranial, and other species. So we finally landed on four. And, um, but yeah, that's, that's constantly changing. So I found that if I do things incrementally, like uh, systematically, and, it, and components where they're modular, I can edit things real quick. Right. So, in this case, I only had a handful of time to pull together the final reconstruction. And in the second step, I decided to give it an environment. Well, I had a week to pull this off. Wow. And I still had to do my duty. So, I worked out, and they gave me a whole selection of texts uh, that, re that showed fossil pieces. I met with the scientist and his assistant who knows a lot about this area, uh, location in the university. And um, Dr. Berman uh, went over this environment with me and I took notes. You know, I had this sketch that I showed him with it. That was a thumbnail that I first up in the top right. Just pasted it out there in the, in the Photoshop image. But these are the names of different plants. So we have, we have um, all kinds of, they're like horse tails. Uh, there's uh, things that tree ferns in the background. So we're going to put all these kind of things together. So I research them. Do some sketches that are a little more clear for the details, like on the, the fern bracts mm -hmm. and the calamides and their branches and the different types of plants and the roots and so forth. So I take all those notes. And these are the names of the plants where they fell. I came up with this. It took 40 hours to produce this at home. Every evening through the week, on top of my job. But this opportunity doesn't come around too often. So why did I do it? It's fun. It's fun. And the original is over there. You'll get to see the original. And it's just, it's neat because how often do you get a fossil in your backyard, basically? This is out by the airport of Pittsburgh. 
And so when you're out in Pittsburgh, think of this critter. This guy's right. You know, this guy came from there. A, a college student that was only a freshman found the fossil. They named it after him. By the time it was published, he was a professor. He was a teacher, high school uh, science teacher down in Delaware. Cool. It was only published about eight, ten years later. So some fossils don't get published for 50 or uh, almost 100 years later, unfortunately. So we were very fortunate on this one. So that's the environment. Then I made a color overlay. And this slide doesn't do it justice at all. It's just color pencil overlay for the items in the background. And what the, what's going on here is there's a lake bed in the back. And this front area used to be underwater. Well, what's happened is it's receding. And it's becoming more dry in this area. So we're getting things like this, pot, this conifer on the far right. So you see a couple of conifer branches. We have tree fern branches coming down. That's calamites post there with the roots to give you scale for the animal. The calamites, the posts were anywhere like this. They're huge. They're huge things. And the, the, list, the salamander kind of animal is two and a half foot long. It's not a huge critter, but it's not incredibly small either. They would eat roaches and stuff like that. But it wouldn't eat, it, 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 there was no animals here. So here we go, we've got this. And then it's superimposing on the computer. Contrast the pencil, superimpose it. And yeah, it loses a little bit by contrasting in the pencil. And I went with a real soft pastel look for the color. But when it's all put together, it just works. We, the focus comes in on the animal. You, get, you have all the, the plant and the environment to complement the story and give it the stage. Um, then about a year later, they asked me to make a model of this thing. Uh -huh. so it's in, uh, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology is going to have their conference in Pittsburgh. That's right. And <coughs> the Carnegie Museum was the one that highlighted um, So, work out the diagram of the information, the proportions, build up the model with paper mache, and they want a life size, actual look. They didn't want to hire someone, they, they wanted to give me the opportunity to make a model. So I took them up on it, because I was making models of insects beforehand, uh, which um, Sue Ellen has a PDF for you guys that she can forward to you, get to you guys later. Um, didn't find the one on um, or babies, but I'll get that to her down the road. Um, my wife and I, incidentally, we're, uh, we've moved over the past year to uh, eastern Pennsylvania. My wife was invited to East Strasburg University to run their small museum and plan the town. And so we moved over there, downsized. We don't have an hour and a half drive to work each day. Uh, it was only 23 miles, but it took anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. And we spend more time, we get to spend more time with our daughter. And uh, she's seven and in second grade. And uh, I get to do freelance and be a home dad and share with you folks. You know? <laughs> so there's the actual fossil. There's the model. And I'm using Promat. It's a sculpt, it's a higher end sculpting that you use for jewelry making. And you cook it in the oven and it hardens. I used um, paper mache on that inner core to keep it light because the shell was going to be heavy. This stuff, <coughs> and the superstructure you saw was brass tubing, square tubing. Mm -hmm. A bird artist that does, he's won a number of international awards uh, over probably over definitely four, 13 or 14. Uh, Larry Barth, he lives in Western PA, also in Alumni CMU. One of my professors connected me to him. And um, Karen Moyer, she connected me to him. He was about 10 years ahead of me. And he uh, became a bird artist. And he, his father was a bird carver, and he became a bird carver. He suggested, don't use round tubing for your insects, use square tubing. Nothing will spin. And it was just something that simple. And he, he shared some, uh, he, you have to buy both the Chromat, which is a higher end sculpting, but the super sculpting was adequate for this kind of work. And then I made out, I made dies to punch the, the, the bumps on there. How do we make bumps all over this smooth object? How do we get the arm to come on and off for casting purposes later? Because we have to cast this to make more prints and then paint it up. Uh, found it and painted it. Uh, did the, the detail trimming. 
So we have the bumps, then we have to chase them in between to get the texture in between so those bumps are raised. So I made little tools uh, with dowels and a treadmill. And uh, there was four different size uh, bumps. There's a skeleton. Oh, there's a final scope. Okay. There's a, uh, over 130 hours of final work in this. But I spent a summer doing this. We're going to have to work a couple times of work on but you don't get much done at work. So, um, Could you bank it? Oh, yeah. We, we brought it to the... Uh, we brought it to the... Uh, they have wonderful ovens down in the, in the um, catering. Of the museum, <laughs> and we put it in their beautiful new oven. This, place, this was the third item I threw in there. We just placed in there, and it just got they get a kick out of it. One time we brought down these little primate, another time we brought this down, and they, they, they think it's fun. You know? they, they don't get to put it, you know, usually they put it in cupcakes and stuff. <laughs> Here they get to put it in this little primitive critter and cook it for 20 minutes. And, then I, I dremel out the, uh, the socket for placing in the eye. We had bird eyes done uh, by a company, Talus, in Philadelphia. They order them in directly from um, uh, Austria. And so they're, they're um, uh, not crystal, they're, they're, they're glass eyes. They use for taxidermy. Mm -hmm. The name's escaping me, I apologize. The uh, <coughs> glass, but they're really clear. And so say that. There's the final image. And we also just put the other for one summer, for about nine months actually. Uh, and one of my colleagues that I was teaching at an art school, Humphrey, uh, she she uh, did the cartoon underneath, and there's Dr. Burton. They, oh my gosh, this is a wonderful fossil! You know, just, he's so, and he doesn't emit, emit too much. I mean, he's pretty, pretty kind of. Oh, God. So that, that oh, image God. changed a lot. Well, for the conference, they wanted yeah, to put this it. little guy in there. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. It's, it's, this, was a, this was before the final rendering of this was done. They wanted, the conference was coming. They were like, get this thing up there. And so we went ahead and did that up for them. There's the process. You can actually download this from the Carnegie Mellon uh, Design Department's alumni page. Uh, Carnegie Mellon University is in Santa where I went to college, and also went to Penn Academy of Fine Art in uh, of Arts in Philadelphia for uh, post -bac. And some other artists I've been inspired with just growing up, I, I was aware of Van Gogh, but um, Audubon, I was always aware of since I was a boy. And you know, <coughs> he was a swashbuckler. He went out there and trailblazed the country before anyone else did, basically, to learn these critters across the country. He got the, unfortunately, shoe, but got the depict, the ivory bill look back. You know, you know, all these kind of mysteries were starting to unfold for not just Americans, but for the Europeans as well. This new world, this new land. Uh, the the um, Art Museum in Pittsburgh, the Carnegie Museum, had a show in Go, and they had this little painting of a moth. And what I liked about this painting was, really captures the quality of this emperor moth in Europe. Even though it's in his style, it captures that quality of the moth. The, the main costal vein in the front, the ice spot on the lily plants, the air worth up behind it. And I've always been inspired by impressionists because when you look at a wing of a butterfly, real close, especially under a microscope, it looks like an impressionist painting. But it just doesn't look like a wing anymore. So this is how I kind of mount some specimens I find dead or so forth. And one of the fun things we do is we rear butterflies and moths. My, my family does. I've been rearing since I was a little kid. And I put them in a little bulb globe on the end table in the living room so people could watch the butterflies come out mm -hmm. and attach a little chrysalis to, this, to the branches. Well, now I have a cage that's got a gay big that I made that has that put a big branch in there, a different branch in a pot of soil. And I hang the chrysalis on there like butterfly, like little ornaments on a Christmas tree. So my wife said, why don't we do our Christmas card like that? <laughs> so for fun, I thought I'd 
show you my studio. <laughs> Probably doesn't look like Winston Peters, but <laughs> if it does, congratulations, because I'm still trying to find stuff there. But um, yeah, I use the tools like you all, and every now and then I get I get a wonderful tools like a Series Seven brush, and they are wonderful. But you know, just go through the same process you do. Create the outlines for the transfer onto the wonderful paper. And in our demo, we're going to talk a little bit about the process of, of uh, layer sketching on vellum or tracing paper, where you can break down your information, your subject, to learn more about it. And that's what I had to do with the bug department as well as the paleo department. And then just work up the image. So here's a watercolor, and then the color pencil, or the red color pencil, over the watercolor washes. The blue, purples, the reds, and then the color pencil over. This is on lacquer watercolor paper. The reason I like that is because, well, one, it's in the cost range uh, at the time, and two, because I had to do 100 plates for them. And the first book we produced 100 plates in two years, and the second book they gave me four years to produce 50 plates. But the paper has little, it's fairly flat, but it has little dimples. And the watercolor hits in there, and the colored pencil just hits on the top. Unless, of course, you press it, then, then it will be flat. Mm -hmm. And I take that, I use that to my advantage, because I work up all the colors, and then I put the black detail in there. So it's like a reverse of the old master's prints, where they do the etchings and then tip in the color. And I'm using a very thin black. It's a prismacolor. And it doesn't give you as rich of a dark, but it gives you the detail. It's a solider lead. So I kind of sometimes you have to split the difference. So work out the veins. The veins are important. The pattern is important. And the the wing actually has has surface structure. It's not flat like a piece of paper. If you see a butterfly in a picture with your flowers or somebody, you know, you're in a show and you see these butterflies or moths flying. And the wings are as flat as a piece of paper. Something's not quite right. Because the, paper, the wings actually have contour. The veins are alive, and the wings, the wings are actually two shells, membranes, and then it's hollow inside. And that's why your moth, like your luna moth, when it's alive, is a gorgeous, beautiful green, emerald green. But when it's dead, it kind of looks kind of brownish, duller. Dull colors. And the older moth becomes faded. An older lunar moth sometimes gets faded because of sunlight and the exposure to air. So, and a lunar moth only lives a week. Some of your large sided last a much longer, but uh, uh, the lunar moths only last about a week. In captivity, they might last a week and a half, maybe two weeks. So, build this up. I threw these in um, mainly to show you some of the process. Uh, I know you folks are experienced, but, but you know, there's contour to the wing, and that ends up in your paper when you're done. So here's the final image. Mm -hmm. What kind of paper did you say? Lake Pearl watercolor paper. I have a block over there that you can look at afterwards. Arches is wonderful. So I, I did buy a pad because I bought three or four different pads, and this was around. 17 or 18 bucks when I, when I was getting the blocks. And then in an art frame, uh, Tom Gallagher suggested, you know, why don't you go to watercolor blocks instead of cutting paper down? And I was like, why not? Yeah, it, it saves time. I don't have to tape everything down. I don't have to screw it down. And it, you just work on paintings. I was working on five to 10 pieces at a time. It was great. And um, I have them stacked off the side, work on them as much as I could, let them dry on standing up. and. So then, um, but I tried arches just way too much like glass. Mm -hmm. I wanted that to, and it, also they were $50 a block too. Yeah. So my budget couldn't handle it and at the time. So here, here I've been inspired by, I knew about this, you know, this, this woman, Marie Simple Marion's work. Uh, since I was a boy, I saw one of her articles in uh, Audubon or Wildlife Magazine, and I knew about her. But I came to learn much more about her with Bernadette Callery at the Carnegie Museum. She was a head librarian at the time. And she also taught at Pitt, University of Pittsburgh. 
she was enamored with science, the history of science illustration, and the the curiosity that came with it. And one of the one of the wonderful moments of of uh, being part of the Carnegie Museum was she would bring me into the rare book collection, like the vault, where, and I get to look through some of these books. Well, same is true at the Carnegie University, Carnegie Mellon University. They have the rare book room two floors down from the Hunter Botanical Garden. And uh, Mary Jo is wonderful about sharing some of these old manuscripts. I even used one of them, uh, 15th century manuscripts, for one of my design projects to study it and, and, and work it into my design project. What's her name? Uh, Mary Jo. I yeah. don't know her last name, I apologize. But um, uh, Bruno will know. Be able to help you with that because I'm not. She may still be there. She was there when I left, but I don't know if she's still there. Uh, she's been there for a number of years. In any respect, on the left, uh, Marie's work in her early years, she was making these small garden books, and that's a photograph. That blood takes a couple snaps, and then this is from the the big Mona Festival that she produced from Suriname on the right of Ross Childier. But on the left, you can see. The life cycle. She was enamored with the life cycle of butterflies and moths and how they related to specific plants. But not just that. Off to the left, see that little chrysalis hanging? The little parasitic, the little flies that, that killed the worm or killed the pupa. She captured that information and she translated it into. Incidentally, have, have any of you seen an original of Marie Sybil Marion's work, a watercolor? Yes, yeah, yeah, Very fortunate. I finally got to see one when I was in Colorado, Denver, given, a, given one of these situations uh, for the botanical group out there, and the local gallery was able to bring in three of her originals. Her watercolors are just a die for They're gorgeous. Are they just as good as anything produced today? But they're on metal. And they're tight. You can take a magnifying glass to the little beetles in her, in her arrangements, and it's just amazing the amount of detail this one. Well, you think about it, it's like, yeah, we spend way too much time watching TV. <laughs> so, some look, contemporary artists are, unfortunately, Peter, Robert Torres Peterson is not with us, but he did field dead work. And he came up with ways to identify birds quickly when you're in the field, because you see them for a fleeting second. Uh, a gentleman here, who shot out, he, he, he got the opportunity, he works as a, a full-time science illustrator for uh, the USDA and the Smithsonian on mosquitoes around the world. And they're quite beautiful. But he also, on the side, did a couple of butterfly field guides for Peterson. Field guide book. He did one of the eastern, and he also did one of the western. Wonderful gentleman. If you get an opportunity to take one of his workshops, wonderful teacher. Um, well, to do a field guide, you get a list, like the list on the left. And then you work up the list on the right of actually what's in that plate. It's not just the species, it's the species and the support plates or support structures with it. Many, many thumbnails. Lots of photographs. When the good time to photograph is in the morning, get that direct, clear, straight light on the bee on the right. Uh, you kind of Go to the side, and when the bee flies in, you have that light coming right on there, and it captures all the detail for you. These cameras now, even these little cell phones, really can take some wonderful photos. Uh, the evening one of the skater, I just I really liked how it just it closed, came out, and it was in the evening. I took a flash picture of it anyway, but that's a posture I used for the final image. Um, monarchs would rear, so we took many photos of them. I, one of my hobbies is to go out ducking and just looking for different birds. And I happened upon a golf course, I happened upon <coughs> this pair of, um, of ducks and um, just just ended up using them directly for the book project. Uh, here we have some woodpeckers, seagull, that posture I just used from the photo. Um, See how the mockingbird has a tail just right down, kind of like a peacock? Uh, all these kind of end up in my work. On the left, the bottom, that's from my collection of the Spicebush Swallowtail. I maintain about a thousand specimens. And 
and uh, of butterflies, and I have a small feather collection of things that I found in my yard. And it helps me get the true color. It gets the detail. Because you know, you spend time working, looking at these things, but the photographs don't always give you the real color. A red-tailed hawk is not red. The males are real dark bronze, like orange red. But the females are red red. I mean, neither one is red red. Neither one's fire orange and red. So getting the real colors. It's a snapshot from my yard, pressed plants. With my wife loves to collect different leaves. There's a sketch of the blue jay with that draping tail like a peacock. Just while I was eating breakfast, I saw that, so I sketched it. The process I use for this to save time, the one on the far left back there when you get a chance afterward of the swallowtails, uh, that's straight watercolor. That's over 70 hours to do that piece on um, Bristol board. Uh, on the left, I brought the trillium image that you can see afterward, and it's watercolor and color pencil. That's about 20 hours. Cuts my time down to a fifth. Very. The quickest image I produced in the book out of 100 images was six, in it, six hours. Was a dead long way. The longest item, which you'll see in this talk, is the um, uh, presentation, is the image of the red tailed hawk, which is 37 and a half hours. Still a lot less than 70 some hours. And for 100 images, maybe. Go on the internet to research the anatomy. Consulting with uh, local fishermen in the building, librarian Paul Depp would suggest it to look at uh, some different artists. Then I made a small model and was able to come up with a sketch on the upper left for the encounter of it. Uh, some bark from a yard. Every yard is like a library. There are so many plants and information. So plant things that you might draw someday. Or that you like. <laughs> or raise plants that you might want to draw someday. Because one, you learn about the plant, you know what it likes, you start learning about attitudes about the plant, and then you learn about the stories. And the stories are what you want to tell. So here, um, it's uh, Sycamore from my wife's leaf collection, and then just blocking in the, the leaf. Here we're dropping in the base colors, and this wasn't a really great photograph I worked from. It was on the top, 30 foot up on a, on a dead branch of a uh, Cherry tree at my in-laws in central PA during migration, these crackles came through. But then I go in there with the black color pencil and detail it, and all of a sudden the color that was really soft and latent becomes brilliant and strong. And it gives you the effect of that nice oily feather look. The internet, some people spend lots of money on really good cameras, and that's what they focus on. They get really good images and they share them with the public. I use some of those images to learn about the eye, the beak, the details, the anatomy. The general gesture I try to get myself, or a posture. And I learned a lot of that while I was doing the stuff at the museum, so I just applied it to the book work. And this is from an observation in my backyard when a pair came, and we're hanging out in our trees in the fall. And five years later, I got the depict piece for a book. Enjoy it for a moment. They're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful birds. So, so you're saying you you got this image from picking bits and pieces of the pileated woodpecker from websites and put them together? Oh. No. No. When I say that, it's, it's like when you go to the library. We don't. How many people go to the library in the past five years? Yeah. All right, some diehards here. We got a couple diehards. Okay, I'm talking to the wrong group. <laughs> General public, how many people go to the library? Not too many. Maybe kids or they bring the family. Libraries are an underutilized resource. There's some really good books, and the books to go to, kids' books. They put money into magazines for kids' photos. I learned that when I was doing the paleo work for the for the paleontology department. That's where we're going to find primates, early anthropo uh, different uh, lemurs, uh, uh, diving beavers, uh, uh, what do you call those platypus. Just, they really, they buy the best photos and they put them in these kids' books. But they become great references for you to learn from. To learn how the water, the air becomes like a bell around the fur. 
and in the monks of fur, and it creates a glow. Um, there's a picture in the one folio that shows that. Uh, that was their second cover of science. But I use the internet to learn about things that I can't get a hold of on my own. Fortunately, at this time, I did have a specimen to work from. Um, my one professor friend found a dead one that hit his window, and so I took some snaps of it, and I was able to work from those snapshots. So I create my own galley shots, reference pages, that have snapshots of birds that I find, and then better. But what's nice is you have that information now. You have that. And so I use that for the beak anatomy, the details of the wear facets on the beak. Because that beak goes through a lot of work. That yeah. beak is squared off at the end for a reason. Because they're plowing through trees <laughs> to get those grubs out. They're after the grubs, they're after the meat, they're after the good food, the protein. And um, so I, I don't want to confuse you with the bit of getting images off the internet. Um, uh, I use it as a reference tool, like you would go to the library and use, or you go to encyclopedias. Here, uh, this is to demonstrate how we use the same bird image for both books. We just change the background and flip the image over the, the different background. And incidentally, when I knock out a background, I do zoom in around 200 dpi, really close, so it becomes seamless. You don't see an edge. And we did that a number of times in our paleo work as well. And I make up a, a little tool book so I can see how the cadence of the, the sketches work. So when you flip through the book, they're not all the same birdshot targets. They have a flow from them. They kind of change around. And so I make up a small folio book. And you can buy these little folios for $5. You slip in little prints, and you can get a feel for how it's flowing when you come through. This is the second book. How do you make the worm interesting? How do you, that's our spider, six hours. I was out at the bird feeder, and we have Lily Valley underneath it, and there was a spider on it, and I was like, whoa, that long harvester. And I'm thinking, that's a great way to depict it. Take one of those stems, mount the specimen in my, from my collection, rehydrate it out, and then sketch it up right away, because it, it's a way to show the animal quick. A lot of times they're walking on rocks or wood. You can't see the details of the animal, how those legs are formed, how they work. Those two, the second leg is actually one that goes out away and far away from the animal to ghost around, kind of like guys. How do you put three different bees together that really don't hang out together? Bumblebees, honeybees do, but wasps don't always hang out with them. So I thought maybe have it sunning on a container on <coughs> Have fun with the plant. Swallowtail, they, the first book they had a uh, black swallowtail on the bottom left. Here, the second book they asked for a spicebush swallowtail. Uh, a lot of, they gave me a lot of free reign on this book. Um, the author just had some subjects she wanted, but then I could put in whatever kind of plant that I would think they'd go together on. Um, this is actually just a picnic table. I, I rear seven eights and butterflies. And that was one of my seventies on the picnic table. I took a snapshot of The author wanted a moth on the bottom, so the bottom actually had a tent moth. The second author wanted a caterpillar. So we dub, we'd make a little patch and we'd dub it in there, and uh, digitally. So take advantage of technology when necessary, when it helps you. But I still like doing the traditional art. I uh, this is, this is uh, the, you know, how do you make this? Engaging inside her face and not yet. Well, then, how do you make, there's our final, final catfish, channel catfish. How do you make it interesting? You know, it's like something out of Star Wars. That's what makes it fun. How do you make peeper frogs cool? We love the chirp. And it's a piece of uh, cherry wood found down the hillside. Not a very good piece, but just interesting, intricate. Because I, I don't want to be bored doing this picture. I really don't want to be bored. This is from my backyard. I couldn't even find one of these things to get references. Two weeks after I finished the image, I found a frog in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> God, I toad. But, uh... <laughs> you know, snapping turtles. The, uh, the publisher was totally miffed by this. Like, they don't find trees. Like, no, it's on driftwood. I just decided not to put the water right <coughs> under. Yeah. So I did find an image of one 
posture like that. And so I was able to posture is from a conservancy website. And it was so small of an image and really bad, but it gave me the character, the attitude of how they hold. And then I just went from the rest by learning about the critters and how to get it in there. But, so I, I've learned how to reconstruct images quite ne decently through the paleontology experience of the coming of the universe. And also the entomology experience, where we, we break down insects and draw the technical drawings. Now, how do you make a black snake look in Yeah. They like to climb in vines. And why are they climbing in those vines? They're looking for baby birds. Oh, yeah. Wait, can I ask about this one? Did yes, you deliberately make that branch coming out on the right look like it's another snake of being this guy? That was coincidence. That was coincidence. That was coincidence. I can think ahead, but not, I'm not that good at a chess point. I can do maybe five or seven moves, but I can't do 30. 15 or 30 is you kind of need for just base level. Um, this was actually a reflection, the backdrop was a reflection on a driveway in New Jersey when I was visiting for the holidays in the fall. And I thought, I used to watch wood ducks when I was a boy on the river in Flemington. And that would be perfect to place a wood duck right in there. Because that's what it looked like when I was watching wood ducks when I was a boy. So you don't know where you're going to find your references. That's what makes it fun. You know, so always looking for ideas. You know, in between taking pictures of family and all that kind of stuff. You know, the normal reality of life. Now, what's interesting about this picture, yeah, it's a large branch, you know, chickadees doing the thing. See those little brown things on the branch? Mm -hmm. The little needles? Mm -hmm. Well, I had this branch sitting on my desk, uh -oh. which I had sitting on my desk yeah. another time to draw a paleo prayer. And, um, and in any event, all of a sudden, those little tan things started to move. <laughs> the they were baby thing. bad words in each needle. Oh, wow. Baby bagworm in the middle of winter. So apparently they overwinter as a first end star, second end star bagworm. Each needle was by itself. It wasn't knitted together. It was hollowed out and a worm came out of each one. Just <laughs> that level, and they were wiggling around. So the things to learn just by being patient. <laughs> on the telephone wires to the house. That's a branch that I was, how am I going to do this woodpecker? Everyone doesn't like wood woodpecker. How do you do these woodpecker inches? And I, I, was, I do a lot of gardening in my yard. I found this chunk of white oak birch. We have a boat, we had in the home we were living in. The trunk was like this big. It was huge, like you would find up in Maine. Gorgeous white birch. Well, one of the branches fell off, and it had those, those lichens on it. And it broke right in the middle. But it didn't break off the branch. The lichen, so it was a little bit longer than what you see there. We just placed it together and put it on my art desk and drew from that. So I lucked out and I was able to break up my composition and make it a very active, proud woodpecker. Same, same is true with this. That sketch you saw earlier of the, uh, the blue jay or of the uh, mockingbird, they always try to find the highest point in the garden. Well, one of the high points in a low garden is the yucca branch. The yucca, the old seed clutches. And on those, if you look in the seed clutch, you see these little circles, these little holes. That's where the yucca moth caterpillar came out. And then makes a, it puts a pupae in the stem of the yucca. But it rears in the seed pods and eats the seeds. A very primitive moth, uh, described by uh, Frank Lamont in, from Cornell. Uh, he was the uh, advisor for one of my professors that are, or one of the curators at the Carnegie Museum, Dr. Rollins whom I trained and worked with for 11 years. He's an wow. entomologist. You can buy beautiful reds, but you can also make beautiful reds by just layering and layering your watercolors. Your colors in your outfit right here, man, would be perfect. They're the colors <laughs> basically. <laughs> but they're layered. It's a little bright, but that's okay. If you look around the belly, that's where the bright is. And then it becomes more verdant red, very much like a Chinese red uh, oil. And it just, it, you just build it up. Um, I just kept layering it. There's got to be 30 layers easy in that red to build up. And that's a favored branch 
that was beside the bird feeder in my front yard, uh, right outside the front window. And the cardinals would always sit down on that branch. So I built in little stories like that. Um, this was, I, I was at a garden party, and uh, that's the photograph at the garden party. I saw this beautiful rock wall with the, uh, the uh, sin foil hanging off it, and I thought, oh, that'd be a great place to put the chipmunk. So, and I had some chipmunk pictures that I took in my yard, and I thought, oh, I'll just place that guy right on there. What has he got in his hand? What's he doing? Eating the seeds. He's not using it like a speaker. He's eating the seeds. <laughs> That's exactly it. I was amazed. I sat in my rabbit cage, and all of a sudden these little things are falling out of the tree. I look up, and there he is eating. What a neat story to build into a picture. And, you know, it's pulling up each frack from the bottom. The, the point tip is at the bottom. The, the stem part is up towards his mouth. He's breaking up each individual one and popping up. The individual seeds, and it's two seeds per cover. Per cover. cover. Uh, Mary Dawson really liked this. Dr. Dawson, she's a uh, former paleontologist, now emeritus at the County Museum, and she studies uh, primitive mammals, early mammals, and uh, to get a compliment from her was really nice. That she appreciated this. Sometimes, sometimes you just don't need a background. Don't need setup, staging. And other times I add in crickets, like little butterflies for fun. This is a clover plate, but I decided to add in a couple butterflies. Butterflies. Uh, actually, Jim White actually complimented me on this piece. He really liked this thing. And it was just taken out back by my tree guardian. Uh, I had, I was, um, it was my teaching day, so I was home uh, after teaching, and so I. I plucked that and just brought it right to the studio and drew that. Twelve hours later, I had a nice plate. Mm -hmm. Look out. You see how those little seeds roll together and you get the little line on it around the um, this hemisphere. There's our sycamore again. <coughs> and those seed pods are really hard to collect. The stem on those seed pods are like wire. They just don't break. So collect it, and the pods pop apart in seconds, yeah. like little, you know, they just explode. So getting one of them was, wasn't that easy. Uh, there's a field guide, and they graced it with the image from the Capitol, and painted for the cherry blossom. Mm -hmm. This is our former book with the, for the city of New York, mm -hmm. and Mayor Bloomberg wrote the forward, and also you know, he's actually rather short kind of guy. He's not exactly tall. He looks as tall as me. But he's, he's, he's a lot shorter. He's, what, he's standing on a podium. And also, incidentally, Dr. Ruth is it's not quite that tall either. He's from the University. But both are wonderful speakers. If you never caught any of their speeches, catch them if you can. They're amazing speakers. Uh, I did get an opportunity to do a conservation stamp. It was an uh, open competition. The state of California that chose my watercolor on Scratchboard. And I chose watercolor on Scratchboard because I could get the detail and pull out those little white hairs with the mm. exact in that. And fortunately, the Carnegie Museum had uh, two specimens of uh, Euterpe, uh, the primrose sphinx moth. And um, so I was worried. And they also had sister species, which I was able to mount and posture. And the, the thing that's interesting about this piece is not the moth, which is now thought to be extinct. It is the plant. There were no good photographs at the time on the internet. I didn't have access to them. I took a herbarium specimen with the permission of the, the botanist of the museum and rehydrated it so far and studied it under the microscope and drew all the parts and reconstructed the plant. And I made a little model out of clay and wire, a little model, just to get the perspective. And we got complimented by the botanist that reviewed the stamp for the competition. And that compliment made it to me. And I was very glad to hear that they appreciated that. I've since seen wonderful photos of this plant uh, on the internet and so forth. And I did okay, but not that great. 
And um, uh, it's, it's mean to be able to support something like conservation. Uh, because the, the work that we get to do, you know, sometimes end up in a book and we don't get to see where they go. And most, a lot of people don't get to see it. This poster was published three times by the, uh, the state of Pennsylvania. The last one was sponsored by the Army Reserves uh, in Wind Gap, or Indian Gap, sorry. Uh, because they actually have a, the largest stand east of the Mississippi of the regal fritillary in the center, which used to be very common when we were all youngsters. And now it's very few isolated spots. I think there's one or two spots in Connecticut uh, and a couple of, all up to Maine. There's a few of them. But they're really isolated spots. They rear on violet, but because we don't have farmlands as much anymore, and they rear, they lay their eggs on the violet dead leaves in the fall. They, the caterpillar comes out and doesn't eat. It just overwinters as a baby caterpillar all winter long, regardless of how much snow. In the springtime, the caterpillar goes and got In the springtime, it warms up, starts eating the new fresh leaves of violet. And they really particularly like arrow leaf violet, the yellow flower. And then they rear right up on a common violet, no problem. And what they do, they rear from uh, early spring right on to May, then they pupate, and they come out in June for the 4th of July weekend, basically. And then uh, they're, in the, they're in the air. And at the Premier Reserve, they burn their fields in August. So that way they don't get all that, the fields are clean for their maneuvers, for their tanks and stuff. Well, these, these butterflies, they lay the eggs on the violets between the grass tufts in the fall. So they don't care that they're burning the fields. It just cleans the area, cleans out the competition. And they have a wonderful preserve. You can actually go see these butterflies alive beginning of July each year. They have three or four or five different days that you can go. Just go to uh, Indian Gap uh, Armory Reserve in Pennsylvania, uh, and they have public days, and they're free. They don't cost anything. And you can see this gorgeous butterfly that has youngsters who probably all saw and didn't realize it. And like any other function, people love to bring stuff home. So I started making these handout pages with my wife. She turns my gibberish into real English, and I do the drawings. And they become nice coloring activity pages for kids and families. And there's some websites on the bottom and so forth. These are free. You're welcome to use them with your church. Copy them up. Uh, let, contact me. I'll send you PDFs. And you can use them with your church, your communities, your, uh, which, your art groups. Same with this polyphemous one. This one was actually, I was invited to share, do some technical drawings for the Hunt Botanical Library. And uh, I thought, well, why don't we turn it into a um, information page? Uh, this is to share the work of John Cody, who unfortunately is not with us anymore. Uh, he did beautiful paintings of moths, 78 moths. I fortunately had the honor of, of getting to know him over, the, over a number of years through the genus I. Uh, the current, uh, across from the current <coughs> museum at Pitt, Cathedral of Learning, they have a pair of peregrine falcons. And for the past 17 years, they've had a number of uh, rearings. So I've produced this page to complement them. I'm going to show over at Science Headquarters. Invited. Eight, uh, 60 some work. And the director not only sponsored that show from the Carnegie, he invited us to show the work at the Carnegie Museum and at Power Mill Nature Reserve, the research facility education center. Uh, so we had the front gallery across from the gift shop. Uh, my wife and I got to carry that show and work with the exhibits and, and so forth to put this exhibit together. Uh, since then, I've shared at the uh, state capitol and had the honor of sharing with a number of other locations. Uh, incidentally, this loud estimate up here um, connects the fossil record of diatomies, and two weeks after the publication, or two months after the publication, my boy, this one scientist, Terry Dawson, gets a phone call and says, I got video of the live, live nasties. <laughs> she was floored. There's no video. Nobody knew about this. She described it. This is a brand new description that came out 
uh, they described it about a year before in Europe. And they didn't connect it to the paleo record. And she's like, it's a dead-on match to diatomies. It's a connecting the paleo record. So she wrote a paper that got into science that connected to the paleo record. So we had a reconstruction from dead specimens to the paleo record. That's why this animal is sitting on a fossil. And the video we saw had the tail up like a chinchilla and a little bit more arch to the nose. In other words, we got a dead-on match on this critter. Wow. And the, the whiskers are actually longer. They go back to the mid, mid body. And these things run up and down. They live in laps. They're called the Laurasian rock rat. And they run up and down the karst rocks, limestone rocks in the, in the jungle, eating insects and small animals and stuff. So the, the locals were using them for food. And the Europeans found these, they found 18 specimens in the local market. This is, a big this is something I want to describe. And they described it, they worked up. Um, so every time, now and then, you might find some butterflies, <laughs> maybe even a friendly dinosaur. And, or if you look up in the air, you might even see a really friendly peregrine. Unfortunately, we lost Dorothy last fall. Uh, she's been, she was there, reigned for 17 years. Of, Oakland and Pittsburgh, and reared 42 young, 42 of her, her that made it to adulthood. Um, her, her daughter, um, Hope, presided at the bridge, the Troyan Bridge, where I used to live by in Lower Borough, and for the past three years, and she's taking over the cathedral of learning. Whether she stays, we're not sure. But she took over and she reared the last <laughs> young from Dorothy, this past spring, or this past summer, <coughs> and uh, the nest is still being under competition by the parasites as well. So we don't know whether she's going to go back to the Turner Bridge. She keeps showing up at both locations, or she's going to take over the reign of her mom. Thank you very much. Thank you.